We need to find the code for Slap the Boo Rhino. I want to see who this is. Does that mean something? Is that some young person code? Is that like... No. I, I, like I've never heard of that. I don't know. You know I, don't, I don't have the insight on you guys. Okay, so we're fitting up the respiratory. We're going to go back to El Diablo. Okay, so we're going to go back to the saturation curve. We're going to talk about carbon dioxide transport, which will really be in seven steps, kind of like I did oxygen transport, just sort of going through it and listing it and see if you understand it. And then we'll talk a little about control, which will be you know, relatively easy. The hard part of this is, I think, understanding the saturation curve. And so we're going to go over that again and then continue where we were, talking about shifting of the curves. So... And, and so we'll see where we are on understanding this overall. Yeah, we're talking about hemoglobin being saturated or how much oxygen is bound to it. And when it's fully saturated, each hemoglobin molecule again can, can, can carry four molecules of oxygen. That's the basic guy here. Again, hemoglobin is going to carry a lot more. But we sort of want to know the dynamics sort of, of, of you know, of when it's loaded and when it's not loaded because that's actually what it's going to be doing. It's loading up with oxygen, and then it's delivering it to the cells. That's its job. And we want to know its properties here. So we've got to use this curve here. Again, overall, the, the y-axis is sort of how saturated this is with oxygen, up to 100%. And again, you could sort of think of it, if you just take one off, that's 75%, 50, 25, and put it to zero because we're doing the curve. Right? So that's what the, what the y-axis is the saturation, I'm not going to rewrite it, it's up there. Now the idea of this is, once again, that it's, you know, the more oxygen that's around it, the more saturated it will be, okay? So, and that's the bottom line. And so, um, that's basically what the x axis is. It's saying, okay, what is the partial pressure of oxygen that this hemoglobin is being exposed to? All the way from zero, which is not going to be in our body up to let's say 100 millimeters of mercury. Now let's see how this how this behaves. And so we'll kind of put that again the, the physiological significant ones you know that sort of matter as we're trying to figure this curve out are 40 millimeters of uh, millimeters I'm having trouble talking about of uh, partial pressure of oxygen which is sort of what we have with the resting cell kind of just a basic <coughs> metabolic cell, how it's going, and 100 is sort of the concentration in the alveoli. And so we want to see how saturated the hemoglobin is at these concentrations, and we notice it's not sort of a straight line, it's linear, it has two kind of areas here. So it's sort of shaped like that. And so you recognize two kind of areas here, an area where it's very saturated and it's kind of a plateau, and then an area which is becoming less and less saturated and it's a very steep. And that's the first thing you notice. And then you describe it. And again, as Stu has sort of uh, indicated, it's sort of, you know, for this type of thing, biology, it's interesting, or it's probably better to look this side first and then this. Because this is sort of when it's loading up with oxygen. If you look at the concentration here, that's what it's being exposed to in the alveoli, okay, as it's passing through. And you see then when it, when the human is exposed to that concentration, it's going to become basically fully saturated. Okay, it's very efficient at sucking up the oxygen that's coming from the lungs, you know, into it, which is good. That's why we call it the loading phase. This is where it is loading up with oxygen. There's always two bullet points here. You know, what's happening here? It's loading up with oxygen. The, a, the other aspect is why, you know, it's sort of, you can say it's different ways, but, you know, it's a plateau. What does that do for us as far as functionality? You know, why is it good to have this as a plateau? Because it's extending. 
it's extending basically. If you have, you know, if you don't, you know, let's say we're do, we don't have 100 millimeters of mercury in, in our OV light. Let's say, you know, you're at high altitude or we have blockages, you know, you have asthma, you're not getting enough in, whatever it is, you want the, the hemoglobin to still, as, it, as, as the, the blood passes through, to become still fully saturated or close to it. You don't want now, okay, well, now we're only, you know, half saturated. That's not very functional. We want this hemoglobin to suck this oxygen up, even if it's not being exposed to quite the same amount. So that sort of is why this, you know, functionally is good for us. Okay? So those are the two things you want to get from the side. Could the second point be um, said uh, that it is a plateau to allow optimal loading of O2, of oxygen? Yeah. Like, <coughs> to be simple and keep it... Or, the, or well, if you... Yeah, I mean, you have to somehow get. I mean, it's not going to be SA2. What? In less than ideal. Condition. Yeah, that's kind of like unless even in less than ideal conditions. I have a hard time coming up. You come up with a succinct way to say all that, and you say it's a little wordy, but that's the correct correct thing. What is that? So I don't know a lot about mercury in the blood. Just why it's at low or higher. Oxygen. It's it's on mercury. It's, it, what do you, which it's just it's how they measure it, right? It's millimeters. Uh, that's just you know, it's almost like a you know, pressure meter, you know, sort of. <coughs> Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, if you're measuring pressure, remember we had mercury and those things, so that's sort of what they still use that as the, as the guideline. Unloading. So that's that, okay? That's loading up. We, it, it, it sucks up oxygen even under less than ideal conditions. Boom, it's done its job. Now it's traveling. It's traveling to the tissues. We don't want it to just hang on to this oxygen all the way back. You know, its point is it has to start giving it up. And that's what's happening during the physiological sort of uh, concentrations of oxygen. When, when, when the blood gets to the tissues, we don't have that kind of oxygen. We have more like 40 uh, or even less when, once the cell becomes active. And under those conditions, we want hemoglobin to release oxygen into the cells. And so that's what's happening here. This is the unloading phase. Instead of staying at 100%, you know, if, you, if once, the, once the blood reaches those tissues, Let's say the cells are at 40, which is kind of normal here. You look at the saturation, it's about 75%. And again, biologically, okay, saturation, okay, doesn't mean as much as what just happened. If it was at 100% and now it's saturated, I mean, it's sorry, it's 75% saturated, what just happened? It released about 25% of oxygen to the tissues that needed it. So it's not going to like dump its entire load there because it's a resting cell. So and we want backup in case we are we have a more active cell. So it's going to be, and this is why it's steep or why it's shaped this way. It needs to be responsive to the needs of the tissue. It needs to give oxygen when it needs it. If the tissue needs more, it needs to give more. And so that's what actually you'll see on this. So you look at 40, again, it released about 25%. If we're highly metabolically active. And we're using up oxygen, let's say we're at 30, it's about 50% saturated, it gave up more, 50%, and you can keep on going. So if we had a plateau, you know, it wouldn't be responsive, it would just keep giving the 25%, even though we need more and more oxygen. So it works out to our advantage, again, that it's steep. So this is the unloading phase, because we're not, we're not keeping it there, we're unloading it to the tissues, and it's steep. Uh, the functionality of that is going to be responsive to the needs of the tissue. Okay, when it needs more, when cells need more, it lets go of more. And that's the basic, you know, before we start doing these switches uh, of the curve, that's the basic thing about what the hemoglobin saturation curve means to us. Does that mean that to you? Yes. Any questions about that? Is it going to be an essay question? No. <laughs> uh, I used to have it as last question, but no. But, you know, because we're, we're going to get to the next level of this, which is going to be shifting of the curves. There, you'll actually see a couple of these on there, okay? And the idea of this will be the following, and I, I'll come back to that. It's a little, well, I can use that. You know, we see curves like this. What's, but this, I just put this in just for the PowerPoint, because it's, it's going to be what I'm going to demonstrate. We're going to see ones in which different conditions in the body are going to cause, we're still going to have the basic shape of the hemoglobin saturation curve, but it's going to be shifted to the right or to the left of normal. And basically, the hemoglobin is responding to different things in the body. Okay? Now, 
there's you could memorize these various things of which way it shifts and just have it as a memorization. But you know how I am about that. I think it's sort of you know more. It's better to sort of put it in an understanding. So when it moves to the right or to the left, does it shorten the plateau or it, the steep? It depends. We'll see. I mean, you know, we'll we'll look at specifically sort of you know how it how, what's it, what's actually doing here. But let's 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 look at basically what it's going to do when it shifts. Okay. And the way we can summarize all this is the following. And once you do this. And all the shifts will make sense to us. So shifting the right or left, it's changing the affinity for hemoglobin, I mean for oxygen. Again, affinity means how tightly it's going to bind versus releasing. And what you, what you have to remember is this. And just, you know, if you just remember what happens to a shift to the right, the shift to the left is opposite. So a shift to the right is going to mean two things. We have really one thing where we're going to say it. A shift to the right means that, that the hemoglobin has less affinity for the oxygen. And what that means, because we're using, again, chemistry and affinity, what that means is, under any of those conditions, it's going to tend to release more oxygen. I'm going to show you that it does that. Because it doesn't bind, like, bind it as tightly. So a shift to the right Lower it means the hemoglobin at any of these concentrations will have a lower affinity for oxygen. It will tend not to hang on to it as much. It will, it will be releasing it more. And I'm going to show you that's true. So all you have to think about when we do these shifts is the following. Because, it's you know, again, it's common sense that anything that you think you'll need more oxygen, you know, any condition in the body in which, yeah, it'd be good to have more oxygen released, it's going to see it shifts to the right. Okay? And that's what, that's what we're going to play with here. Let me show you, I'm just going to use this one. Let me show you this statement is true. That, that when hemoglobin shifted to the right, you know, the curve, the saturation curve, it's going to release more oxygen. To, and so, you know, if you're like, what does that mean? Does it really? Well, let's show you. I'll show you. I'll just use the pH one right now. We'll, we'll put it here. Again, the one in the middle is the normal one. And if you look again at 40, we said at 40, it was now 75% saturated, so it released how much? about 25%. Let's look at the shift to the right one. We'll still go up at 40. It's about 60% saturated. What did it release about? 20%. Is that more? Yes. Okay. You see how if you do that on any of these, the shift to the right means, or will indicate, it's releasing more oxygen. So a shift to the right means something has happened to the hemoglobin to sort of change its conformation. Now it's not going to bind oxygen as tightly. Basically, in any of these conditions, it's going to tend to release more. Okay, so this is to sh show you, you know, that, that I didn't just make this up, uh, that it actually is real. Because I think conceptually, you're like, you know, trying to figure that out doesn't make a lot of sense. Shift to the right, why is it releasing more? Okay, right now the idea is that is true. And so if you remember this, and then we'll see how we'll put all the things together on most of these curves. If you sort of realize or memorize whatever, that the shift to the right means it's going to release more oxygen. So anytime you think we need more oxygen to release, you're going to see those conditions are what shifts it to the right. And so the, the way I relate a lot of the ones here is to metabolism, okay, exercise. And let's just kind of think of what happens with high metabolism. So again, high metabolism, because now we've been playing with this. And the last unit in, in this one. If cells and tissues are in high are highly metabolic compared to normal, they're having a lot of activity. Okay, what are the relative gas concentrations within the tissue? High CO2 and... So, would you think, anything, that all things associated with high metabolism, you know, do you think we want the hemoglobin to release more oxygen? Yes. We don't have enough oxygen. We want more. Okay, we don't want hemoglobin to hang on tightly. So, everything associated with high metabolism, which is high CO2, low O2, okay, those conditions, that means we want it to release more oxygen. We need more oxygen. Yes or no? Yes. Yes. Okay, so let's think of the, some of the things that are associated with this. Well, first of all, is high CO2 associated with this? Yes. Okay, and we'll just put that there. So, we expect that higher concentrations of CO2 should shift to the curve to the right, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that we'll find out in a minute. All right? Two, how about temperature? 
That's higher temperature. So we expect, if we're right, that higher temperature will shift it to the right. Okay. Remember, we have, the idea is the right is when it's releasing more oxygen. We know we want it shifted to the right. And so what are the conditions associated with it? High CO2, high temperature. Okay, let's try to look at this guy. We're going to see this a lot again in the next couple weeks. Does everybody remember this equation? Carbon dioxide plus water. Reversal reaction, hydrogen ions and bicarbonate. Hydrogen ions relate to what? pH. pH. Okay, so if you have high CO2, what do you expect to happen here? The law of mass The law of mass whatever. The law of mass action will cause the shifting. That's hydrogen ions increasing. What is that for pH? Acidity or low pH. So we expect that the low pH can be associated with all this. So we would expect low pH to shift to the right. Right. Okay, you've got to start to get this idea that we're starting here. We're saying shift to the right means it's going to release more oxygen. Okay, and you saw it up here, right? Or you saw it back, back over here. Okay, and we just said it. Shift to the right means it releases more oxygen. Everybody agree? Yes. Okay, and we agree anything that means we need more oxygen probably is going to shift it to the right. When we have high metabolism, do we need more oxygen? Yes. So everything associated is going to shift to the right. And so we just put three things. Higher CO2, higher temperature, lower pH. Well, let's find out. Okay, high CO2 shifts to the right. right. right? This is higher than that one. Higher temperature shifts to the right. Lower pH shifts to the right. Okay? Now you can memorize these separately and read the book and talk about all these different laws and stuff like that. I think it's you know, not necessary. You know, the, things work by common sense. Our body is working. We're here. So basically, if you think we need more oxygen, it's going to respond. And you know, the way it's actually responding is, and we'll see this as we go, you know, we mentioned this overall too. Hemoglobin can bind hydrogen. Hemoglobin can bind, and we're going to see this in the next, the next part here, CO2. So as we're producing those, it's coming to the hemoglobin molecule, binding, changing its shape, and making it so it's not binding to the oxygen as tightly. That's why hemoglobin, remember I said I thought it was kind of cool, and you're like, yeah, whatever, Mike, you're weird. Uh, you're going to see it's multifunctional. Not only does it have the sort of properties that we talk about here, but it's going to respond to these needs of the tissue, or needs of the body, by, and part of it is just because these other molecules bind to it and will change its shape, in this case, to release more oxygen. So, you know, you can memorize those separately or do whatever you want, but to me, it makes sense to put it all in a scheme of things. And so, you know, it's not like only high metabolism does it. I mean, if you have a fever, you know, you're going to have this type of thing. Other conditions can cause this. But the bottom line, you can tie these three curves. You have like five curves. You can tie all three of these into this, and they should start to make sense. Okay? So that's, that's it. Again, shift to the left, which I'll have on the test, right? What's that? Low, low, high pH. Yeah. Um, you said that at 75%, at 75% saturation, 25% of so how do we know at what other saturation is what's being released, or do we not? Well, you, you know, you, I mean, you don't have to know, no, but you can follow it, right? I mean, you literally, if you have the chart, you'll see what get, gets released. I mean, I, I guess that's, you know, okay, I mean... I didn't see, I, I mean, we see the 40 there, but that doesn't like, mean 25% of being released, does it? It means about 25% of being released, right? If you, you know, because you see about, I mean, you know, it's approximate, right? But, about, you know, it's, it became almost 100% saturated when it picked up in the lungs. After it passed this, it's only 75% saturated. So, it released about 25%. Okay? If you, if you want to know what it was at 30, you follow it up. It's like, you know, well, let's say it's here, 50% saturated, so it released about, so you actually can follow basically what it's being, what it's releasing, you know, you know, 
And again, it, the curve is like saturation. It's a chemistry curve, right? So for us, it's really thinking about what was released. At least that makes more sense to us. If you're doing chemistry and you're going to biochemistry and you're in that class, they're going to be talking, they're going to start on this side and start talking about what this means as far as the oxygen goes because it actually has a different meaning here. But we're biology people, right? So we're kind of going functionally what's happening. Does everybody sort of get high? And again, you know, this is something where you've got to like practice it and see if you get it. But if you remember shift to the right means, that's the real key here. It means something consistent. A shift to the right means it's releasing more oxygen. So conditions in which you need more oxygen, which clearly fit from high metabolism, you're shifting to the right. And that's three of the five curves. Okay? Again, this is the hard part of the chapter. Two more curves that we need to know at least. So we just did this, I have some of that information up there. Okay, this guy. Let's look at this. 2,3 diphosphoglycerate, 2,3 DPG for you and me. Okay, I probably won't throw that out. What this is is the following. Let's say you, you basically are under hypox hypoxic conditions. You're not getting enough oxygen. It could be, you know, you've gone to higher altitude, it could be you have some sort of problem, you know, uh, not, not getting enough oxygen in, right? You can have a blockage or et cetera. If you're not getting enough oxygen, okay, by that, right? well, which way do you want the curve to shift? Right, right. To the right. Now, the key is, if you're not getting enough oxygen, you're going to rely more upon glycolysis, you know, anaerobic respiration, you know, that you produce lactic acid, et cetera. You're going to rely more on that, okay? And, but you still really want, to, want that hemoglobin, whatever oxygen it has to give it up. So, one of the intermediates in glycolysis is 2,3-DPG, okay? Glycolysis is several steps. If you've ever memorized that, you kind of know that. One of those intermediates is that, is that molecule. Guess what? It comes along, binds to hemoglobin at a different site, and tells the hemoglobin, shift to the right. We don't have much oxygen here. I'm doing my job. I'm doing glycolysis. We need you to release more oxygen. We can't, you know, don't be as, as stingy with it because the body needs more oxygen. So, chronic hypoxia, clearly, we need the hemoglobin to release more oxygen. That means to us now, it shifts to the right. The mechanism that works is that one of these intermediates in glycolysis comes and binds to the hemoglobin, changes the shape, releases it more, and that's why shift to the right. So, that's the fourth of the five curves. Again, all of them should, you know, you can memorize them separately, but all of them should make sense if you remember. You need more oxygen, you're going to shift to the right. Everything we just talked about, clearly we needed more oxygen release. Is that what that blue line is? The, the, the red line is shift to the right. The, right. the one in the middle represents the, uh, the normal condition. Right. So the one in the right, which is red, is the one where we add 2,3-DBG. Oh. Okay. okay. So right now, all we've talked about, you can see there's curves to the left. All we talked about is what shifts it to the right. Shift to the left is exactly the opposite. Okay? Conditions in which you don't need the oxygen as much, which are the opposite, <laughs> is that you'll shift, you'll shift to the left. Because if you're under lower metabolism, hey, you know, we don't need to release more oxygen, right? We can actually conserve it. Uh, so, never mind. You've got to practice this, but this is four of the five curves. Yes, ma'am. It will shift to the right. Any condition in which you're not getting enough oxygen, and that's another another condition, means that you know we're going to have these different things like that that will modify the hemoglobin to release more hemoglobin, which is the shift to the right. So hemoglobin, again, everyone probably knows, oh, okay, it carries oxygen. You can see it's a lot more complicated than that. It's a lot more, you know, if you look at hemoglobin along species, you know, evolution, you know, you know, it started off not quite as, as multifunctional. How are you doing? So you don't need me now for the exam? I do, but I said, well, well, no. I got Susie to do it, yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay, same. That's four of the five curves. So remember, of course I'm going to have shifts to the left because I'm that mean guy, okay? So obviously that's the opposite conditions. If you know shift to the right, shift to the left are opposite. Again, some extra questions are on, you know, that play with that are on the extra questions on this.
in the first or the, the other curve that we talked to, like maybe two slides before that? Which the the um I guess eight. Um, Why, yes, this. What pH? Nope. Yes, that. Um, <clears throat> that shift to the right is the blue line for that case. Well, I, think, I don't or, know I mean, what color you see. It's, it's, <laughs> that it's, the line in the middle for all these is always it's normal. normal. Okay? okay. So whatever color you want to make this, and on on the test, it's going to be black. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We're gonna have black, 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 <laughs> and our you know, basic kind of, So you know, the key is you know, there's a middle curve is the normal curve. The one to the right is the shift to the right. Okay. Everyone sees different colors. What color do you see? So I'm not understanding. So if it's already shifted to the right, why do we have another shift to the right when you add two? You're, you're not. You're in the middle. Right. So if if you if you add two three dBg, it shifts. It you know you're not shifting and shifting. Where is this thing? You're saying you know that this is the normal curve. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you're under these conditions, two three dBg uh, binds and causes a shift to the right. Oh. So the middle one is the normal one. This is just saying if you do the opposite, it will shift to the left of the normal. So the normal is the normal. And all we're talking about is the shift to the right. The shift to the left will be the opposite. You know, to this. If the conditions are exactly opposite to what we said, you're going to have a shift to the left. So you said there were five curves? Yes. And those are four? And then you said? No. These should be three. It's basically... We did the CO2, temperature, and pH. Okay? This is the fourth one. Oh, I thought you meant actual curves, like there will be five of them. The, no, there's five conditions yeah. that, that we're going to shift okay. to the right. And so there's three of them. Again, here's one of them. Now let's have a baby. I'll, I'll, put, I'll show you that there. So uh, I'm not suggesting this. I'm saying let's, let's actually deal with this here. So, so this one is shifted to the left, okay? Fetal hemoglobin, and the, the idea of this is the following. And really what we need to know is sort of about the words up here. So if you look at maternal hemoglobin, we just described what it looks like, okay? That's the normal curve. So the key is it shifted to the left, as you can see. And two things about this, okay? I'm sort of a why, I'm not trying to, to go crazy on it. For, for the baby, is the baby exposed to this much oxygen in its little tiny little no. developing lungs. No. So you wouldn't want it like that, but if it's exposed <gasps> to this area, this amount, that's where you want to be picking it up, okay? It doesn't have this kind of concentration of, you know, uh, or in the cells, because it's again, we have lower oxygen concentrations in the baby, the cells are under lower activity here, so basically this is gonna be the activity of the cells. So the, the idea that's not going crazy on again is that it shifted to the left, that this meets the conditions of the fetus. This is more fitting the conditions of the fetus. This, they're not exposed to any of this, it wouldn't work. The mechanism is the following. Fetal hemoglobin uses gamma chains instead of beta chains. The hemoglobin itself, the hemoglobin itself had two alpha, two beta, that was the maternal one. This one, the, the, uh, the fetal hemoglobin, has two alpha, but it has two gamma. So a similar, you know, they're similar chains, but there's slight differences. That gives the hemoglobin different properties that matches that. So fetal hemoglobin is different. That's why when you have a newborn, and I'm not going to put it on this one because we've already kind of done that, when, you know, a lot of times a newborn will have jaundice. Why is that? Because we're trying to get rid of all that fetal hemoglobin and get like adult hemoglobin. We've got to destroy all that hemoglobin. The liver is going to take it up and we're going to convert it to bilirubin. And it takes a while to get rid of that bilirubin and build up the bilirubin. Jaundice. So nothing wrong with the baby, per se, uh, but you've got you to take care of that. That's, but that's why a lot of newborns will have jaundice. They don't have like liver failure or anything. It's simply they're overloaded, trying to get rid of all that fetal hemoglobin and convert it to, uh, you know, our hemoglobin that will, you know, get our, will be this working in our oxygen condition. That's the fifth curve. Okay, the fourth curve, and, and again, you know, this one just is shift to the left. We're not playing with this at all. But the other ones, you know, we're talking about the shift to the right, and all you have to do is if I, you know, reverse it, it's shifting to the left. If I put us under, you know, hypo, you know, hypothermia, low temperature, shift to the left. 
So anything else that's different. And that's the hemoglobin saturation curve. So you start from the beginning, you draw it, you make sure you understand what's happening here and here. You remember, shift to the right means it's going to re release more oxygen. Anything that makes sense to you means it will shift to the right. You can relate high metabolism, not enough oxygen, shift to the right. So the only one you have to remember is kind of that 2,3 DPG is a little different than these things. But those three fit together, 2,3 DPG, and then throw fetal to the left. So this is the fifth. This is the fifth. This is the fifth. Right. Oh, so this, there's okay. this, this, this. There's 2,3 DPG is the fourth. And then there's fetal hemoglobin is the fifth. OK? Those are the five curves. Yes. Yes. Well, where are you? Let me go there. Yeah. Sure. Low pH. High pH, right. That's why, as long as you got one, you know, you got it. It would just be the other. I got a couple of those for sure. I mean, because that's just. Not the cases, we say there's a shift to the right, so what, is, what happens is more in terms of the. The conditions, you know, you'll be, I'll give you the conditions, and you're telling me it doesn't shift to the right or left. Okay? Carbon dioxide transport. So we've done plenty with oxygen. Carbon dioxide is actually almost, is in some ways, more important to get rid of. If you don't get rid of carbon dioxide, you acidify your blood. All the proteins start dying. If we don't, if we don't have quite enough oxygen, do you see how we kind of have a buffer here? Okay, we're not getting quite enough oxygen in our body. We have the idea of maybe we want to increase some respiration, but we have hemoglobin here that's, that's got all this backup. And so and we have glycolysis to get energy. So, you know, we have a backup here. But if you start getting carbon dioxide buildup, if we're not getting rid of that efficiently, we are going to start acidifying our blood, okay? Low pH. We call that from the previous slide on this, hypercapnia. A buildup of this... CO2. We're more concerned. We're going to react, and we're going to show you in the last part of this, you know, our, respi our brain, you know, that's controlling respiration is going to react more to those CO2 levels uh, than they are to the oxygen levels because of this backup. So, how do we transport CO2? Here's some words, but I'm going to write seven steps. But just to kind of see it, you know, almost a quarter of it is going to be transported by our friend. Even though. 7% about will be dissolved, okay, uh, because CO2 is 20 times more soluble than oxygen. But look where most of it is. Most of it's going to be transported as bicarbonate. Which is HCO3 minus. Ah, blood cells. Got a lot of this stuff going on, and we're about to see it. California, the enzyme. Here are the seven steps. I'm going to use, again, I already put that. I'm going to use this crazy figure here that really it's going to be the seven steps that follow it, okay? And they have this equation here that they put the intermediate. And so we're going to sort of go the same way that we did oxygen transport from the lungs to the da. Now we're starting in the tissues and then to the blood cells. And I'm going to write basically these steps and it reverses in the lung. And I'm literally going to write it reverses in the lung. So really I'm looking at these steps here. This whole idea is called the chloride shift, and you're going to see why at step six. So let's write this by stepwise. And we'll put it over here. CO2 transport, the chloride shift. One, two, three, four, five, Six. Probably have a seven. So, we look at this figure here. We have CO2, a lot of it building up in the tissues. So, what do you think the first step's going to be? To release it. To the plasma. And what do we call that? Diffusion. So, it's going to be very similar to what we did with oxygen. It's going to be a lot of diffusion here, and, and, and then exploiting it like crazy. But it's all about diffusion. That's how gases flow. CO2 diffuses from the tissue 
put an arrow into the plasma. And again, as it says up there, you know, 7% of all that we're going to transport literally would be transported dissolved in the plasma. It's more soluble. It's not less than 2% of oxygen. It's about 7%. Okay, that's not enough. We, not, we have to get rid of more. So, what's going to be the next step? Do we want it out of here? What's this red blood cell? Do we want it in the red blood cell? It's yes. Yeah, we got to get it in to do this stuff, right? So, second step, CO2 diffuses from? Plasma into red blood cell. Okay? It can't bind with hemoglobin or do any of this other stuff until it gets in. We have diffusion, diffusion, just like we did with oxygen. Does everybody remember that proxy? You're write it down. We diffused and we diffused, and then we did stuff inside. We're about to do stuff inside. So remember, if we didn't do anything inside, we'd be done. You know, we'd come to an equilibrium, get a little CO2 out, and that would be it. We've got to start playing with that CO2. If we can get rid of this free CO2, what's going to happen? We're going to recreate a gradient. concentration gradient. More comes in. We're going to recreate. A gradient. Yeah, and therefore, O2. we're going to start unloading O2, our CO2 more efficiently. Okay? And we are going to do that big time. Okay? Four steps. So, you know, oxygen was easy compared to this. We're going to maximize CO2 getting, you know, unloading of it because of this danger. So we're, all of it's going to be exploiting diffusion now. Diffusion, diffusion, all these arrows like I did before are kind of like how to, how to recreate these concentration gradients. Now, this isn't like in particular order, like this happens first, but I'm going to write one of them first. The first thing that's going to help us is CO2 is going to bind with our friend. Hopefully it's our friend now. Hemoglobin. And as it's doing that again, that means now there's less free CO2, diffusion, diffusion. You know, again, we put that number up there. About 23%, again, you know, it's about its water, is going to be carried by uh, hemoglobin all the way for its release. So hemoglobin, a major worker in our body, as you can see. So CO2 binds with hemoglobin, and again, about 23%. We'll use their numbers, are going to be carried to the lungs that way. And as we did before, by getting rid of the free CO2, it drives those first two steps. It recreates the concentration radiance, boom, we unload more. So when you say 23% will be carried to the lungs, you're not, are you talking about CO2? Okay. This whole, these numbers here, the 77 and 23 is what percent of CO2, you know, how it's, how it's getting there, out of the, you know, it's up to 100%. We've done the 7, now we've done the 23. Now the next one is our friend, and you're going to see this in the kidney as well. It's this guy right here. CO2 plus water, I skipped this intermediate, is going to produce hydrogen and bicarbonate. As that happens, so, you know, the, you know they, again, they draw it kind of weird here, they put the intermediate. Here's our California. The red blood cell. No nucleus, no organelles, right? It is a sack of what? Hemoglobin and enzymes. Its function is to carry gases, okay? We don't need to do anything else. Do that for a couple months and we'll make more. That's basically it. That's its job. And so it does it very efficiently. So we did the hemoglobin part, okay? It's been involved in a lot. Now check this out. If we go ahead and this reaction occurs, because we've got that enzyme and we make these products, what's happening to free CO2 now? Exactly. So, and I'll just put this here. We'll just put CO2 plus H2O, because this is what's going to happen with the free CO2, is going to go ahead and then be converted to hydrogen ions plus bicarbonate. Okay? We're getting rid of free CO2 a second way by converting it to these products. Less free CO2, recreate concentration, concentration, we exploit diffusion. All right? We get it. Diffuse, diffuse, and now, because we bind it up, more diffusion. Now we convert it, more diffusion. We're efficiently getting rid of the CO2 from the cell. Okay? You know, we're using diffusion, but by getting rid of the free CO2, these methods, we, we keep recreating the concentration gradients to drive this process. We want this to be efficient. So it's diffusion, but we're exploiting it. Now, are you satisfied with that? Is that enough CO2 out? Not. Okay? If you look at this, 
and we do the law of mass action, if we want this to shift this way and get rid of more free CO2, what, what should we do with these products? Get rid of them. If we get rid of hydrogen, which way does it shift? This way. If we get rid of bicarbonate, which way does it shift? This way. That's what five and six are. So for the fifth, first one, or the one we're going to write first is, you know that, that hydrogen here? First of all, if we did nothing, what would happen to the pH inside that red blood cell if we keep making hydrogen ions? It would become acidic. Yeah, that'd be bad news. Who's going to come to the rescue? Hemoglobin. Yep. Hemoglobin is going to bind with this hydrogen. So I just put HP, you know, H plus. And again, that has that has two functions. It's acting as a buffer, right? It's so so when this is bound, okay, that we're not creating any difference in pH. It's acting as a buffer, but by removing this product, drives the reaction, drives diffusion. So again, it helps us now get even further. As long as we remove these products here, okay, I don't like the way they do it here. As long as you're removing them, which we're doing this, and we're going to do this final step, you're going to drive more CO2 coming out. Okay, by removing the products, we drive this reaction, recreate, recreate, so boom, boom, boom. So we've gotten rid of the hydrogen, thanks, thanks for hemoglobin. How about that bicarbonate that needs a negative value? Okay, how about the bicarbonate? Here is sort of the name of, you know, why we're we calling this the chloride ship. Look what we're going to do to that. We're going to get rid of it, all right. We're going to transport it out into the plasma. Okay, and 70% of all the CO2 we got out is going to be actually going through the blood and basically transport the lungs just as bicarbonate ion. And check, check out why this might be. First of all, we get it now. If we do that, what's that going to do to these concentration gradients? So check, so do you see sort of the efficiency now? This is all diffusion, but then exploiting it by getting rid of the free CO2. So now what we're doing, we are really efficiently unloading that CO2. And this carries 70%. Which one of these is more soluble in like fluid like our blood? Between these two, bicarbonate. You know, like ions and sodium ions and all that stuff, remember they dissolve. This is sort of a small molecule that's hydrophobic, doesn't like water that much, but better than oxygen. So you can't, you can't, it won't dissolve very much, but this is very soluble. Plus, this is the major buffer we have outside the cell. We add, as we've been, we'll still play with this, if we add hydrogen out here in the blood, it will suck it up and basically take it out, of, you know, it won't acidify. So it's a major player here. So we transport bicarbonate out. But look what we're doing as well. We are transporting Chloride. chloride in. That's why it's called the chloride shift. Okay. In general, just kind of looking at this, why might it be good to put chloride in? What are we taking out? Bicarbonate, which is what charge? Okay. Do you want to change the, the potential between negative and positive right now? Do you want to make this? Do you want to make this inside positive now, or do you want to keep it sort of the same uh, level of compared to outside? If you take negative out. We want to put negative in. So that's step six, the chloride shift. Okay, chloride shift, we're putting, we're transporting HCO, HCO3 minus bicarbonate out, slash, we're transporting chloride ion into the red blood cell. Again, without even sort of doing it, all these steps are driving diffusion, okay? That's driving the unloading of all that CO2 we can from this tissue because of the danger that it has by building up. So, you know, the other one, with oxygen, we had a couple things to help us get it through, but for this, we've got all of these steps. By the way, step seven for us is this whole process, all six steps reverse in lungs. Because I don't want to write all steps, six steps again. I don't want you to sort of have to memorize it. But actually, if you look at it, because of these concentration gradients, everything works opposite. And you can actually see here in the lungs, or you know, as we're approaching the lungs now, we have the opposite idea. Fluoride goes out, bicarbonate goes in, and we start basically going back to CO2 and we breathe it out. All the same idea, concentration gradients, etc. Everything's in reverse. So I don't want to look at that at all. Just know that it reverses. 
I just want you to understand sort of how we are getting it out, okay? And it's those six steps. Again, chloride shift, it's bicarbonate. Seventy percent of all of the CO2 being transported will be in that form of bicarbonate ion. That would be CO2 transport. That would be step five? Wait, wait, she, she had her hand up now. Well, that's okay. I was just for step five, that's what I was wondering. Um, like, if, is it unbinding? Is it a re reversible reaction? It, it will be here. <laughs> so, it, you know, when you, again, everything, again, without even going into the specifics, just like we do with oxygen, all the conditions here will, will basically be, again, higher concentration of this goes out, and yeah, so all these will go the exact opposite way. All these are reversible bindings, and all the changes switches because of the conditions near the lung. <coughs> okay, just like we kind of did with oxygen, but obviously six steps, so we're not writing those six steps. That's why we're just saying, hey, we believe you might get reverses in the lungs. So, diffusion, diffusion. Okay, we actually have to exploit that. We're going to bind some with hemoglobin. That will help us. We're going to convert some of it to these products. That helps us. We're going to get rid of these products to drive this reaction more. Hemoglobin will bind with the hydrogen. That takes care of that product. We're going to shift from its bicarbonate out. That really drives this process and at the same time put chloride in for the equalized charge, that would be the chloride shift. So I'm confused because I thought that hemoglobin binds with hydrogen and then makes hemoglobin and hydrogen. Well, that, I mean, it's, that's just showing that it's bound. I mean, I don't know how you want to put it. It's, it hemoglobin oh, is bound to the hydrogen. Okay. Okay. So it's like this, I'm here to draw it. So it's just bound. Okay, oh. that's the fifth step. Then the sixth step is this chloride shift. Isn't the 70% step six? It, it, it is. I mean, I, I just couldn't, you know, it is. Okay, I just couldn't, you know, I couldn't fit it in. It's pointing to the bicarbonate, okay, uh, you know, over here. So I just, you know, I just ran out of room. The 70% is the bicarbonate, which is step six. Is the bicarbonate a transporting out, right? The 70% is the bicarbonate being transferred out. Well, it, it, yes, it's being transported out, and that's, that's the form of CO2 that's being carried now. We converted it to that, and most of it's been converted to that, and that's what's traveling. Last part of this chapter, control. Okay, all those words are just what I just set up here. Now, that looks like crazy, and it is, but... We're going to make it simple, simple. So, with this and this picture, for control, these all of these things we put up here, which are going to be basically oxygen levels, CO2 levels, and correspondingly H plus levels. Okay, those are the three things floating around in the blood that we're going to have receptors for that will determine are we going to increase respiration or decrease respiration, control respiration. We have central, or sorry, I'll do peripheral first, but I'll put it over here. We have two basic classes of receptors that are going to monitor these compounds and determine, send messages to the brain to increase or decrease. There's peripheral receptors and central receptors. Now, Here's the peripheral ones. Look where they're located. Aorta and carotid artery. Does that sound familiar? Mm -hmm. Same place barrel receptors are. And they're monitoring those gases and everything. All you need to know about this is they primarily, you don't have to know the, the, you know, the steps I could talk about. We've done this before. Uh, but it's going to basically monitor really the oxygen. Okay. So its main goal is to monitor of all these three substances, it's most sensitive to oxygen concentrations. O2, CO, and C, o and C concentrations. So if it senses low O2, it's going to signal the brain to increase respiration to get more air in, which makes sense. If which one? Which part? Yeah, what, what the, you said last. If, if, again, well, let's just say it again. For these peripheral receptors, all you have to know is it's most sensitive to oxygen concentrations. If you have below normal, which it kind of says up there, low P, you know, uh, oxygen. If you have low oxygen, it's going to signal, it goes through nerves, signal the brain to increase respiration to get more oxygen in. 
Okay? Of all these factors, it is sensitive to the oxygen. Here's the last slide of this, uh, of this chapter. We have central chemoreceptors, and they're located in the brain. And what are they most responsive to? CO2. Because look what cerebral spinal fluid has. Does this equation look familiar? CO2 plus water. Again, we skipped the intermediate. Hydrogen plus bicarbonate. Hydrogen binds, says we better increase ventilation to get rid of that CO2. CO2 is a little more critical, so it's in our brain that those receptors react, right? So it's not reacting to the oxygen as much. You know, the peripheral will react to that. It's reacting to carbon dioxide levels and corresponding then the hydrogen levels. So the central ones are basically responding to, to these, okay? Versus the peripheral ones respond to the oxygen primarily. They, all, they respond to all, you know, all of them responding to this, but we're talking preferential. And so preferentially, all, that's is all you have to remember, the peripheral are responding to oxygen levels. Centrally, the, uh, the central chemoreceptors here are responding to the carbon dioxide and hydrogen levels. And you can see why. All the other details of this section that you look at, you don't need to know. You really, because we've got enough detail here. All you've got to know is this, okay? Peripheral responds to low O2. Central responds to CO2 levels. And that, you know, again, makes sense. We've got to get rid of the CO2. Our brain is involved in that, like, right away. Then you increase ventilation. And then if you have, again, under these conditions, obviously if you have high CO2, correspondingly high hydrogen levels, yes, you will increase ventilation because we know we want to blow out that acid. Okay? Well, I put respiration and ventilation, same thing, but different words. What can I say? Lots of words mean the same thing. Chapter 17, chapter 18. Okay, respiratory system. Chapter 17, mostly involved in math. Chapter 18, a little bit harder, okay? Same thing coming up. Chapter 19, which we're going to start on in two and a half minutes, the easy kidney. Chapter 20, the hard kidney. So what we're going to do today is chapter 19. Again, we'll get a, you know, half of it done during the normal class period, and then we'll take a couple minutes and see who stays, and then we'll finish it up uh, and then. And then I'm also then available to go over this again, that again, equations again, anything you want to go over. Also, before you leave, though, uh, you want to make sure you take a copy of, uh, of the take-home quiz. Again, there are, let's see how many, I think there's 30 questions, each one's two points, 60 points. Everybody should get this, right, in one way or the other, you should be able to get it. It's got blood typing problems, it's got respiratory problems. On the test coming up in two weeks from today, there's going to be a couple of those respiratory problems. So those are really important that you do. I won't retest blood typing again, but it's sort of important. So, multiple, or again, you turn in both this and the Scantron next Wednesday when you come and we'll get those graded right away. Hopefully most people should be able to get A's on that. 60 out of 60, not gonna curve this. Okay, so, uh, uh, but you know, that should, that should help. So, no more labs after that. Chapter 19, get your slides out, get ready. Yeah, we got